and that's um, it's not the most material that we've ever had to cover in one lesson. In fact, I think next Wednesday's uh, lesson will be a little bit more as far as text is concerned. Uh, but I'm I'm not sure we're going to make it all the way through this one. Uh, I guess we'll, we will see how it goes. Uh, but we're getting into the the building of the temple in Jerusalem, and there's an awful lot to discuss, and there's a, a fair amount of um, uh, perhaps somewhat tedious detail, and we won't go into every tiny little bit of it uh, over the next couple of weeks. But that is going to be pretty much the focus up for the, for the next several chapters. Uh, before we get into that, Tim is going to lead us in a prayer, but before that, I have a few things that I wanted to announce. You're probably aware of a number of these things already, but uh, I'll, I'll mention them even so. Um, there are a number missing tonight, mostly, I'm sure, due to a stomach bug, and uh, I feel partially responsible for that because I think that my family were the patients like zero through four, and uh, so sorry if you have suffered from that. Um, also, I sent out an email earlier about how Jim Thornton is uh, in, he's, he's getting, uh, his, hopefully his gallbladder removed and at least a gallstone removed, and that's, a, that's usually a relatively routine procedure, but due to some uh, previous medical history of his, it's a little bit more uh, complex, and they were, they were talking about, instead of doing laparoscopic the way they usually do, actually slicing him open and trying to uh, uh, sort of go old school there. I haven't gotten any updates yet from Cheryl on him, but uh, I'm hoping that things have gone well, and we will certainly keep him in our prayers until we find out more. Uh, on top of that, uh, Tina's father was mentioned on Sunday as having a heart procedure. That's been pushed back to, uh, Nancy, I think you said tomorrow? tomorrow. Okay, so uh, keep him in your prayers as well, and I'm missing one or two other things. Anyone remember what they were? <laughs> if not, then we will just have our opening prayer and then get into class. Tim? Let's bow. <clears throat> Righteous Heavenly Father, we come before you on this Wednesday evening to uh, be thankful, Father, for the opportunity that we have to open your word and study from it, Father, that we might understand about uh, the life of Solomon as we enter into now his, his reign and understand uh, about the wisdom that uh, he had and that uh, you granted it, Father, and that you, we know that you uh, will answer our prayers, Father, and we use that pattern, Father, to uh, petition you on the behalf of our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in need of our prayers or health issues, Father, and we pray that you'll uh, look down upon the Father and um, attend to their immediate needs that you might allow them to come back here. Uh, Father, we pray for wisdom ourselves, Father, that we might uh, utilize uh, our understanding of your word to uh, be a good example to others, Father, in the way we, we pray, the way we reach out and encourage each other, the way we edify each other, the way we uh, try to make each other's lives easier because of the things that we can do for each other. And we just pray that you'll help us to be a caring and loving congregation, Father, that looks out to the needs of our brothers and sisters, but also, uh, more importantly, for the lost, Father, that are, are not found you. So help us each day, Father, to uh, let our light shine that we might be uh, good examples to uh, those around us. We're thankful, Father, for uh, the opportunity we have to be your servants. We pray that you'll help us each day to be more Christ-like in our activities and our and love for each other and our compassion. We pray, Father, you'll help us to focus on the heavenly things above that have been prepared for us. Help us to be righteous, Father, in, in your eyes that we might uh, repent of any sins that we have against you. Help us to understand, Father, that the, the importance of uh, correcting any wrongs that we might have in our lives, we might uh, put those things uh, away and to focus on uh, the life that you would want us to live as, as your children. Help us each day, Father, to uh, look for opportunities to uh, teach the lost, to uh, live a Christian life, Father, as you would have us, uh, as Jesus is our example. Help us to pattern our lives more like him. We ask that you'll be with us as we open your word this evening. Help us to have a ready mind that we might uh, participate in the class. We ask all these things in the name of your Son. Amen. <clears throat> Who has the memory verse prepared? Carrots? <coughs> if you will walk in my ways, keep
keep you my statutes and commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. First Kings 3.14. Very good. And we, uh, uh, let's see. <coughs> I remember. Yeah, I guess we were in chapters 3 and 4 on Sunday, so we covered uh, that particular text just recently. And who can give us a little bit broader recap on the Sunday class? Carrie? Pretty much Solomon is starting to consolidate his rule now that David's gone and making alliances, especially with Egypt to the south. And then we have the story on how uh, Solomon became so wise on what God offered him and what he decided to do, and which caused him to be the wisest man and the richest man, and uh, just goes on more that going to prolong his days and just setting him all up to to rule well uh, for the people. Yeah, so we have seen a uh, a pretty stark shift in the not the tone exactly, but in the the subject matter of. The, of, the, of the story, because we've been reading in First and Second Samuel for such a long time, and throughout those books, most of the story had to do with various wars and battles and conflicts, and not that there's no conflict under <coughs> Solomon, but it's mostly on a very low, like a, a small personal level, and even with that, he, he took care of uh, you know, settling some accounts at the very beginning of his reign based on the advice that his father gave him about people like uh, Shimei and Joab, and we could also throw in Adonijah and, um, who am I missing here, uh, Abiathar, although that's not a, a violent uh, end for him. And, you know, so he's, there, there's certainly bloodshed, but it's not in the context of warfare. And now we shift away from this, um, this, this, power through military might mentality, and we start getting into Solomon's reign, which is characterized by peace and prosperity, economic prosperity, as well as we can say religious prosperity, if that makes sense. And that's a theme that is going to continue for much of Solomon's reign. It's going to for the next several chapters. And of course, we tend to look at it as if, you know, chapter five and six and seven and, and eight, uh, as well as, uh, let's say, the beginning of nine are all kind of focused on the building of the of the temple, and so that's like you know one episode of the story. But let's remember that took a really long time. It was a, a multi-year-long project, and that's not even counting the, the time that was spent preparing it. And we'll get into some of that uh, both tonight and on Sunday as well. So. It's a huge undertaking, and it's a major focus of Solomon's reign because he didn't have to, at least in part, because he didn't have to spend his efforts as king just protecting his borders. That wasn't an issue. God gave him peace from all of his enemies all around, and instead he had influence over them, even more influence in some ways than his father had had. And so he is able to turn inward and work on not just protecting, but building. And of course, this has some kind of New Testament shadows for us as well. Uh, there are certainly lessons for us to learn. But with all of that said, let's get into the reading for uh, 1 Kings chapter 5. And I think that we would be coming over here to the front right. Uh, Mallory, could you pl please read for us 1 Kings 5 verses 1 through 6? Um, king Hiram of Tyre sent messengers to Solomon when he heard that he had been anointed king in his father's place. Hiram had always been an ally of David. Solomon then sent this message to Hiram. You know that my father David was unable to build a temple to honor the Lord, his God, for he was busy fighting battles on all fronts while the Lord subdued his enemies. But now the Lord and my God has made me secure on all fronts, and there is no adversary or dangerous threat. So I have decided to build a temple to honor the Lord my God, as the Lord instructed my father David, your son, whom I will put on your throne in your place, is the one who will build a temple to honor me. <coughs> Thank you. Um, before question number one, a brief note on pronunciation. So uh, Mallory is pronouncing Hiram, and that's actually quite correct. I, you'll probably hear me uh, go back and forth between that and Hiram because that's the way I heard it growing up and my family knows a guy named Hiram. So uh, just apologies for any confusion that ensues because of that. Question number one, who sent his servants to assist Solomon in the building of the temple? 
Hiram. Okay, yeah. So Karen has picked the, uh, the, the, the long English eye version. And who is this guy? King of Tyre. The King of Tyre. Where is Tyre? Up on the far northwest of the, the region there on the border next to Sidon. Tyre and Sidon are together up in there. Yeah, well, I mean, next to it. It's, it's, it's quite a few miles away, but it's still it's, it's part of that same little uh, Phoenician polity, let's call it. On the Mediterranean and, coast. What's that? On the Mediterranean coast. Yeah, it's right on the Mediterranean coast. In fact, you could say it's uh, a little bit past the Mediterranean coast because the city is an island that is just offshore. Um, was there something? I heard a voice over here. Anything to add to that? Okay. So, uh, why were why were these servants sent initially? So the question is said to, to assist in building the temple. Why were they sent in the first place? Karen? Because Hiram had been friends with David, friendly with David, and he wanted to show support to Solomon at this point. Yeah, this is a relatively standard practice. It's a, a delegation on, a, on sort of a goodwill mission to the new king. Um, we've seen examples of this in the past. You remember where David uh, heard about the death of the Ammonite king, and he sent a delegation basically for the same reason, in order to commiserate with the, uh, the, um, the, the new king, who is the son of the old dead king, and was not received very well, and they were sent packing and... and uh, uh, Badly embarrassed, and that led to conflict between David and the Ammonites uh, as a result. So, um, in this case, it's very well received, and they're able to continue the relationship that David and Hiram had uh, previous to Solomon, and things look pretty good. Why, according to Solomon, did David not build the temple? <clears throat> Spilled too much blood. Uh, did, I see, did I hear something from Andrew? He was in battle. Okay, yes. Yeah. So he was occupied with war, basically, for his entire reign. Is that the whole picture? <clears throat> not, not entirely. Go ahead, Gary. Didn't God tell him he wasn't going to build his house for him? Yeah, so he was... I mean, there, there were times in, at which David could have spent the requisite amount of time and, and effort and uh, resources in order to do this, but God told him no. Of course, what was God's reason for telling him no? Of the blood. Because of the blood that he had shed in, in war. So it is tightly connected, but I just want to make sure that we're clear on that. When Solomon says... Solomon kind of makes it sound like, well, David was just always too busy to get around to doing this. And, well, that's, I mean, it's connected to the, the battles, but it's not just that he was too busy, although he was very busy with warfare for most of his reign. Uh, I am having a hard time reading my own writing here. Let me see this. Okay, so how was the, how was the situation different now, uh, according to Solomon? Nancy? There was peace. Everywhere. On Everywhere. every side is what he said. And um, so I said at the beginning, as we were sort of introducing this, that there are some New Testament shadows in this. Anyone, can anyone figure out what in the world I'm talking about and explain it to me, Tim? Well, I read a note that um, in verse 4, neither is their adversary that that word there actually meant, had a reference to Satan. Yeah, well, the, so like the the name Satan is just a Hebrew word for adversary, right? But that that I mean, Christ would put Satan under his feet, right? right? And not until that had happened for David was now his temple going to be built. Exactly. So um, it's as if God's people, let's say, is surrounded by enemies, and in the case of David's kingdom, they are physical enemies, but they are sort of representations of spiritual enemies and as much as they are not God's people and they war against God's people, right? Now, when God sets his chosen anointed king on the throne in David, David busies himself with putting all of those enemies under his feet. And his, um, let's say, spiritual father in heaven who said to him, Psalm 2, you are my son, today I have begotten you, 
when he puts all those kings, all those uh, enemies, under David's feet, now what ensues? Well, we've got a time of peace, and what does he do with that situation? What does David's son do with that situation? Starts building a house. He starts building a house for God to dwell in. Starts building a temple of the Lord. Okay, now we, I've already kind of uh, tried to use some, some, some terms that are easy to see how it applies to Christ, but now we've got God, God's chosen anointed king who is uh, put, on, put on a throne, not, not a physical throne, but the, the spiritual throne, let's say, of his father David, because he's also a descendant of David, and uh, given, given power to conquer his enemies. Now, as the author of Hebrews says, we do not yet see every enemy under his feet, but we can certainly see how that work is in progress and we get a, a taste of it, or we see a, a foreshadowing of it, a very clear foreshadowing of it, when Christ rises from the grave, that is not completely conquering, but it is a major victory over death, which is tied up with, with sin and corruption. It's tied up with Satan himself. So he has uh, uh, performed a victory. You know, he has, he has uh, achieved, there we go, achieved a great victory over these spiritual enemies, which are far worse than the physical ones, put them under his feet, and... What did he set about doing afterward? What has he been doing for the last almost 2,000 years? Building his kingdom. Building a house for God to dwell in. That's the church. That's us. That's the, the, the souls here and across the whole world that uh, have, have been joined to God's people. And so we are now not only part of God's people, we're part of God's dwelling place. So we see all these, uh, these, these shadows of the plan that God always had in mind, and he plays the whole thing out several times over, and the, the, the situation with David and Solomon is one of the clearest predictions. And it's not a, it's not like, you know, when, when Daniel or Isaiah prophesied and said, you know, the days will come to pass when this will happen. There's plenty of that, too. But God also sort of mimes out what he's going to do spiritually. And we are supposed to take those as uh, predictions, if not exactly prophecies, in just the same way. Okay, number two. What exceptional and needed skill did the Sidonians have? Nancy? They knew how to cut the wood. Yes, they were very good at cutting timber. So, speaking of New Testament foreshadowing, from the beginning of the work... Who were enlisted to help building God's house? Karen? Foreigners. Foreigners. Gentiles. That seems important, doesn't it? Let's keep reading. Dan, can you take verses 7 through 12? Karen heard the words of Solomon. He rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord today who has given to David a wise son over this great people. Aaron sent word to Solomon, saying, I have heard the message which you have sent me. I will do what you desire concerning the cedar and cypress timber. My servants will bring them down from Lebanon to the sea, and I will make them into graphs to go by sea to the place where you direct me. I will have them broken up there, and you shall carry them away. Then you shall accomplish my desire by giving food to my household. But Aaron gave Solomon as much as he desired of the cedar and cypress timber. Solomon then gave Aaron 20,000 cores of wheat, as food for his household and twenty cores of beaten oil that Solomon would give Aaron year of year by year. The Lord gave wisdom to Solomon just as he promised him, and there was peace between Aaron and Solomon, and the two of them made a covenant. Thank you. Question number three What did Hiram give to Solomon, and what did he get in return? Carrie? Gave him the wood for building the temple, and he got food. In return for his people. Okay. Uh, yes. Now, uh, let's see. We're going to come back to this at some point here. I guess I'll just trust my notes. Um, so this point that I, I, I just got at a, a minute ago where from the beginning there are Gentiles helping. Should Solomon be working like this hand in hand with these Gentiles on a project for God's people like this? 
Is that, so to speak, kosher? <clears throat> Tim? Well, God gave him the instructions, you know, a long time ago for the plan of the, uh, you know, the tabernacle. And, you know, but he never told him where to get the materials, right? You use these materials, but you know where, where to get those. That wasn't specified, so you can get them from, you know, wherever. Yeah, so there's gonna there's you you expect that there's gonna be some level of cooperation regardless, Carrie. And and it's not the the wood's being given to them. He's paying for it. Mm -hmm. So does that say, well, you're not allowed to do commerce with people that are around you? Yeah, that would be that would make it impossible to live in the world. And this is a point that um, that that Paul gets. At, in a slightly different manner in 1 Corinthians 5 when he says, I wrote to you not to associate with people who are sexually immoral. I meant like brethren because to not associate with worldly people who are sexually immoral just means that you have to leave the world and that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be the salt and the light of the world. We're supposed to be an influence on the world and not to just completely uh, back away from it. Now, we're not supposed to be influenced by it. It needs to go in the right direction. We're not supposed to be unequally yoked to the world, but we are supposed to live in the world, although we're not supposed to be of the world. Now, if we fast forward a few hundred years after uh, uh, this temple has been completed and, and used and desecrated a number of times, eventually destroyed by the Babylonians, and then they go a period of several decades without one, and they, uh, uh, the, the Jews are allowed to come back to their homeland by, by Cyrus's decree, and they start to rebuild the temple. And in that instance, in Ezra, and we also see it in Nehemiah, there are Gentiles who step up and they say, great, we want to help. And the response from the, the, the authorities, including Ezra and Nehemiah, is to say, uh-uh, <laughs> no, 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 you're not doing that. This is our job to build it. So what's the difference? Why would they say, you Gentiles can't help, but in this case, it's totally fine? Nancy? Well, the... The Jews had sinned, and that caused the destruction of the temple. So it's their job to put temple back in order. I'm sorry, say it again? That they, because the Jews had sinned, and that, that's why everything oh, okay. was destroyed, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. then it was up to them to put it back together. Yeah, there's some truth to that for sure, that they, um, if nothing else, they kind of feel like this is our responsibility, and it wouldn't be right for us to pass it off on somebody else in a similar fashion to what David recently did with the whole uh, sacrifices uh, on the threshing floor of Iran and the Jebus site. And, no, 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 don't, don't give it to me. i got to buy it from you. Otherwise, it's pointless. What else, Mallory? In here, in person, we're reading about like, the raw materials and how they're getting there. Yeah. So there's like a degree of separation. Exactly. And this is kind of what Tim was getting at earlier. you got to get them somewhere, right? And he, uh, Terry also said, well, they were buying them. It wasn't just a pure gift. They're not actually involved in like in, in, in putting, it, putting it together, putting one stone on top of another. They're not in the sanctuary overlaying it with gold. They have their place, and there is a degree of separation between the help that they are giving, wonderful though it is, and the actual building of the sanctuary of the Lord on uh, his holy hill. Okay, so. <clears throat> uh, this also highlights that degrees of separation and all that, that, that's great. Let's also remember the situation here in the Old Testament is not the Jews get to go to heaven and everyone else goes to hell. <laughs> Sometimes we're, I know we, nobody really says that, nobody thinks that really, but sometimes we, in the back of our minds, we treat it like that's the case. The Gentiles are all bad and the Jews are all good. Well, we follow the story of the Jews and we see, we see how many times they sin. It's constant. In some ways, God is more upset, and he even says this, he's more upset with his own people than he is with the Gentiles because his people should know better and he has higher expectations of them. Uh, but... That's not to say that those who are in the, uh, in the nations are irretrievably lost. That was just never the case. Uh, there, there is reason to make a, a separation, of course, between God's people and the rest of the world. And certainly that doesn't mean all oh, the Gentiles are perfect or anything like that. But there's no reason to, for the, the Jews to just be totally belligerent toward them all the time and to uh, uh, you know, cut themselves off completely. 
Question number four. What did God give to Solomon as he had promised? Wisdom. 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 We talked about that at some length, of course, on Sunday. Let's keep reading. Uh, Samantha, could you take verses 13 through 18? Then King Solomon conscripted a labor force of 30,000 men from all Israel. He sent them to Lebanon and ships, 10,000 every month, so that each man would be one month in Lebanon and two months at home. Adar Darner was in charge of the labor force. Solomon also had 70,000 common laborers, 80,000 quarry workers in the hill country. Mm -hmm. Am sorry. I wrong? Yeah, yeah, sorry. I'm like I'm trying to figure out where the um first Kings five Did I okay, you're yeah, you're right, I'm the one who's wrong. I'm sorry, keep going, keep going. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time. Um Solomon had seventy thousand common laborers, eighty thousand quarry workers in the hill country, and thirty six hundred foremen to supervise the work. At the king's command, they quarried large blocks of high-quality stone and shaped them to make the foundation of the temple. Men from the city of Gable helped Solomon and Hiram's builders prepare the timber and stone for the temple. Right, thank you. Number five, who was in charge of Solomon's labor force and what was its size? Adonara? I don't know. Yeah, Adoniram, Ad 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 however you want to say it, I don't care. And the size? What's that? A lot. A lot, yeah, very big. Um, there's, a num there's, there's, there's a number of numbers. There, there's a, a, a slew of different numbers that you could list here, but um, specifically the draft, so the forced labor drafted was 30,000 men. And then besides that draft, there's also uh, 80,000 stonecutters, 70,000 uh, burden bearers, and then 3,300 chief officers and whatnot. So there, was, there are a lot of backs being brought into this work. By the way, in uh, verse 13 there, King Solomon drafted forced labor. What is forced labor? Slates? Kinda. Kinda. It, uh, yeah, it's it's conscription into service. It's he goes he goes out and says, You come here and you know bear this burden. And if you don't, then we're gonna whip you until you do or otherwise penalize you. It, it's it's not exactly the same as like the chattel slavery that was once practiced in the uh, in the well in, in the American South and broader America for a while there, but um it's not terribly different either. Go ahead, Mallory. Solomon volunteered. So Solomon, what? Basically, Bolin told them, like, here, you're going to volunteer to do this thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he, uh, my my old Latin teacher used to say he volunteered them because the Latin verb volo means I want to do something, and he's like, well, I I don't want to do this, but I'm being told to do it. So he he volunteered them. Um, yeah. Uh, however. Whom did he conscript for this work? Israel. What's that? It says out of Israel, so... Okay, it says out of Israel. But... You have a note? I have a note. <laughs> I have a really good study Bible here. It's, it's the people that he had... Or that had been conquered over time. It was not necessarily the Israelites themselves... In fact, it's necessarily not Israelites themselves. So if you jump forward to uh, chapter 9, verse 15, I will read that for us if I ever get there. Chapter 9, verse 15, this is the account of the forced labor that King Solomon drafted to build the house of the Lord in his own house, etc. Okay, now we jump down to verse 20, now that we know what we're talking about. All the people who were left of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, who were not of the people of Israel, their descendants who were left after them in the land, whom the people of Israel were unable to devote to destruction, these Solomon drafted to be slaves, and so they are to this day. But of the people of Israel, Solomon made no slaves. They were the soldiers, they were his officials, his commanders, his captains, his chariot commanders, and his horsemen. Okay, so... Um, yeah, we, we see a distinction being made here between the Israelites and the Gentiles who were still being allowed to live in the Israelites' land. There were a lot of these, and this is another thing that goes un, unnoticed or un, uh, 
unmentioned a lot, that we tend to think of it as if we, we, we know that under Joshua, they, they, didn't, they didn't get everybody. And then with the judges, we know that, yeah, there's the Philistines and the Midianites and the, uh, the, the Canaanites that are constantly badgering them and making things difficult. But we start to think that it's as if, like, by the end of Judges, there's, there's no Gentiles left. Well, of course, there's that weird little pocket of Jebusites uh, in the city that later became Jerusalem, and so David had to come. But that's pr pretty much it, right? There's no more Gentiles. There's tons of Gentiles still living within Israelite land. Lots and lots and lots of them. And there were provisions and laws made about that uh, for a long time, and that is where Solomon was getting this, um, shall we say, forced labor. Chapter 9 just calls it slavery. However, was Solomon just heartless toward these Gentile conscripts? No. Karen says no. How so? Well, he only made them work for a month at a time. Yeah. And then they got to go home for two months. That's right. So... That's not, I mean, it's not great. Being forced to do anything is never great, but it's better than it could have been. <laughs> absolutely. So he's absolutely showing, uh, he's showing some, let's say, humanity to them. I guess that's, that's not really true. Uh, it's more that he's showing some divinity to them, I guess. Showing humanity to them would be just forcing them to do whatever he wants. But showing some divinity to them and uh, some loving kindness, even though he is conscripting them into this labor and saying, you're going to do this work whether you like it or not. It's like, okay, well, I'm taking one out of three days from you. That's really not that bad. Uh, we take for granted that nothing like that's going to happen to us here. A lot of countries around this world have mandatory national service and that sort of thing. It's not a whole lot different from this, where everybody on turning 18 doesn't just have to register for the draft like we do, but actually has to enter the armed services and serve for a period of who knows how long, maybe a couple of years or even more, before they are allowed to go back into normal society. So, you know, whatever you, for, for whatever bad things you might have to say about what Solomon is doing here, it's kind of a lesser version of what still happens across the world today and is taken as totally normal and fine. All right. Let's keep reading. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Malachi has a hand up. Um, when you were talking about like, the, the Gentiles that are still there, if I remember correctly, in one of the many boring books in with the laws, weren't like people, sojourners and conquered people, they were allowed to be there as long as they upheld God's rules. So that, to your point, like there are Gentiles who basically still follow God's rule, just, they just didn't have the right bloodline. Right. Yeah, basically, yeah. So, uh, and we see examples of this. I mean, there was Arauna the Jebusite. That's a Gentile, and David not only um, you know had dealings with him, but insisted on paying him the, the, the proper value for the land that he was buying from him, which of course is where this temple is going to end up sitting. Uh, we had another of David's helper, well, <laughs> uh, helper slash victims, Uriah the Hittite. It's another Gentile who was not only living in the land, but was actually uh, a, a, a significant member of, uh, of David's, um, David's army, let's say, uh, a captain of, among his, uh, his, his mighty men. So, um, yeah, lots and lots of Gentile-Jew interaction that was, you know, benevolent and, well, let's say benign is a better way to put it. Okay. Now, uh, Kevin, can you take verses 1 through 7 of chapter 6, please? It was in mid-spring in the month of Zid, during the fourth year of Solomon's reign, that he began to construct the temple of the Lord. This was 480 years after the people of Israel were rescued from their slavery in the land of Egypt. The temple that King Solomon built for the Lord was 90 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 45 feet high. The entry room at the front of the temple was 30 feet wide, running across the entire width of the temple. It projected outward 15 feet from the front of the temple. Solomon also made narrow recessed windows throughout the temple. He built a complex of rooms against the outer walls of the temple, all the way around the sides and rear of the building. The complex was three stories high, the bottom floor being seven and a half feet wide, the second floor nine feet wide, and the top floor ten and a half feet wide. The rooms were connected to the walls of the temple by beam dressing on ledges built out from the wall. So the beams were not inserted into the walls themselves. The stones used in the construction of the temple were finished at the quarry 
So there was no sound of hammer, axe, or any other iron tool at the building site. Thank you. Okay, number seven. What were the temple's dimensions? Sixty cubits length, width twenty cubits, height thirty cubits, which is ninety by thirty by forty-five. Okay, so um, for reference, ninety feet is almost exactly from that wall to the front door there, and then uh, thirty feet is. It's it's not quite it's not it's like half as wide roughly as this auditorium. Okay, so like from I guess about where Janet sits to about where Mallory sits, that's the the width of the temple, and it's about the length of this building. Okay, and of course, forty five feet high is just way way up there. Um, was this just a simple box? An elegant. Very, very elegant. There's a detail that, I mean, I've read this. I, I can't tell you how many times I've read this, but this time going through it, I noticed another detail that uh, and actually the artist rendition covers um, on the, the, the previous page. I just gave myself a paper cup. Um, where if you look at the, the, the side wall where there's a cross section, you'll notice that the wall starts out really thick at the bottom, and then it goes up to the top of the first story, and then it gets a little bit thinner. But on the outside, of course, it just goes straight up, but there's like an offset for each story. And that's part of the pattern here, that there's this offset here so that they didn't have to stick any wooden beams through the stone in order to have like an unsightly, inelegant hole with a piece of wood sticking out of it. And instead, they built this entire exterior with this, this ridiculously overly thick out, outer wall at the bottom and then stepped it up so that they could rest the, the roof beams, which need to be wood, on top of it instead for the aesthetics of it. The aesthetics, the, that, uh, the word that Janet used was elegant. I think that's a really, really good um, description of this design. By the way, this artist rendering here, um, obviously it's just an artist rendering. It's pretty good. I think it's very accurate to the, uh, the text here. Um, that's why I chose to include it. And uh, if you haven't already, take some time looking at this thing and know that it's not just some guy's crazy image of, you know, I bet it looked something like this. It's pretty, pretty close detail by detail to what the text says about it. Um, so if you want to get some kind of an image in your head, I'm sure it didn't look exactly like this, of course, but it's it's, it's pretty close. There's something else that I wanted to cover here. Uh, yeah, the, so Janet said, elegant, it's very elaborate. It's obviously very carefully planned and constructed. What extra step did they take? What extra, I guess, series of steps did they take just to avoid there being the noise of construction on that hill? Mallory, is that what you're going to answer that? Oh, yeah, I was going to say the woods that they or the rocks that they used, they had to all be shaped. Offsite, and then run it. Just <laughs> contemplate for a moment how much more difficult that is with our modern methods. Even I remember uh, most of you guys been to my my old house before we ended up having to move, and so you remember that we had the house, and then we had like that whole yard, and then the garage. Well, the garage is where all the tools were, and. I hated it whenever I needed to do something in the house when all my tools were in the garage just because I had to clump up and down this hill that was realistically not that long. It's like a couple hundred feet long over and over and over in order to say like, ah, well, I was a quarter inch off, so let's go shave that down and then come back. It was ridiculous. They did this with an entire temple built of stone. They had to figure everything out just so and get all of the, the stone cutting and dressing down so that everything was exactly how it ought to be, and then haul it up this hill, put it in place, and hope it fit. This was a huge undertaking with all of these little details, no corners cut, no expenses spared. They were willing to go to great lengths, even in the process of building it, to make sure that the process of building it was also elegant and elaborate and reverent toward the God they serve. Now, What's the significance behind having like the windows framed? Like people didn't frame windows. I mean they didn't have glass in them. So 
that's just another detail that we just made our windows pretty. Yes, yeah, the just on and on and on with these little details. It's uh, a, a very large undertaking. It's not just a, a, a hollow box that's going to hold the Ark of the Covenant. There's a lot more to it than that. All right, we're going to skip a bit here. And uh, Andrew, could you read for us verses 14 through 22? When Solomon finished building the temple, he paneled the interior temple walls with cedar boards from the temple floor to the surface of the ceiling. He overlaid the interior with wood. He also overlaid the floor with cypress boards. Then he lined 30 feet of the rear of the temple with cedar boards from the floor to the surface of the ceiling. And he built the interior as an inner sanctuary, most holy place. <clears throat> the temple, that is, the sanctuary in front of the most holy place was 60 feet long. The cedar paneling inside the temple was carved with ornamental cords and flower blossoms. Everything was cedar, not a stone could be seen. He prepared the inner sanctuary inside the temple. He put the Ark of the Lord's Covenant there. The interior of the sanctuary was 30 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 30 feet high. He overlaid it with pure gold. He also overlaid the cedar altar. Next, Solomon overlaid the interior of the temple with pure gold, and he hung gold chains across the front of the inner sanctuary and overlaid it with gold. So he added the gold overlay to the entire temple until everything was completely finished, including the entire altar that belongs to the inner sanctuary. Thank you. Question number eight. Of what was the temple constructed? <clears throat> Slightly complicated answer here. Well, it, was made hand of, up? it was made of stone, and then it was made out of cedar. Okay. Tim? And cypress and gold. Yes. And the cypress, so cypress is a, a slight distinction from cedar, but they're basically the same. Um, they're, oh, we'll come back to that, I guess. So the outside, to look at it from the outside, you just see stone. Everything is, um, you know, finely dressed, polished stone. But on the end, and you wouldn't see any wood. Remember, they, they did that offset thing so there'd be no holes with wood beams sticking out. And then on the inside, you couldn't see any stones. On the outside, you don't see any wood. On the inside, you don't see any stone. Everything is covered with cedar. And then on top of that, it's overlaid with gold. Uh, Janet? Did they use a mortar or some kind of something on the stone? Presumably there was some, but uh, I just with know this Greek sort of masonry, you don't necessarily need it. Right. Because they're really stupidly heavy stones that have been very, very finely dressed to fit perfectly. Karen? The, the um, pyramids don't have mortar, do they? Aren't they? Uh, I do not know, but I... I feel like that I've always heard that they are just stone on top of stone. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a similar, it's called ashlar masonry, where you take, you get the biggest <laughs> rock that you can, pretty much, and you shape it exactly as it needs to be, uh, and, then, and then put it in place. You don't really need mortar to hold it together. Okay, so why would they use uh, cedar and cypress in particular? Why was why did that matter? Carrie? Well, I know cedar people used to make have cedar closets still to repel moths and bugs and stuff. So I'm assuming there's some kind of property about cedar that not only repels bugs but maybe just fares better, ages better. Exactly. It, it lasts a very long time. It, it has um, oils in it that are resistant to decay, which handles both, you know, the, the fungus and the, the pests that typically uh, will get into your wood and tear it apart. So uh, it lasts a very long time. It's also very carvable. It's relatively lightweight and it's, it's strong in tensile applications. Uh, what about stone? Why stone on the outside? I mean, if cedar's so great, then why not just make the whole thing out of cedar? Mallory? Stone is fireproof. <laughs> yeah, stone, stone is uh, even more long-lasting. It's fireproof. It, it, it's a lot more, um, let's say, monumental looking for good reason. So even these minute little details, you know, we're talking about practical things here, but they put in the time and the effort to figure this out. That's not the whole story because we're going to talk about uh, uh, when we pick up on Sunday where else they were getting these details from. But uh, just, I want to impress upon you the level of detail-oriented work that was being put into this to make sure that everything was being done to the absolute best of their ability. 
And of course, that's a great example for us to apply as we continue this work building God's house in the New Testament page. That's where we'll leave it for tonight, and we'll pick up and finish this lesson and hopefully get all the way through 305 on Sunday. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, we'll sing 408, Lily of the Valley. We'll sing that. I think Dan, is he doing the invitation? Dan's doing the invitation, so we'll sing this before that. Um, the song of invitation will be 291. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my strength. He tells me every care I live to He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Oh, he all my griefs has taken, and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken, and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Yeah. 
his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Good evening. It's good to see everybody here at midweek. We got bit of a light crowd tonight for uh, reasons mostly of illness from what I'm, what I'm told, but it doesn't sound like uh, my family missed much at least. So um, We do want to remember Jim though at that, uh, that gallbladder procedure that uh, Jeremy mentioned um, in his uh, remarks before the, uh, the Bible class this evening. Um, <clears throat> I had an invitation prepared um, that is at least uh, a little bit in reference uh, to an invitation that Dustin had delivered near uh, the beginning of the year. Uh, if you remember that, uh, I, was, I think it was the first week in January, something like that, um, Dustin uh, had the invitation on a Wednesday, uh, and he was talking um, about uh, running races and the idea that fourth place is uh, the worst place because it's kind of like first loser and that you were the you know, you were the person who was closest to making it to the podium, but couldn't quite summon enough to get on there, and, and so on and so forth. And a lot of his, it was a good invitation, and a lot of his comments uh, were based on 1 Corinthians, um, <clears throat> the ninth chapter, uh, verse 24 was one of the ones that he read. Uh, and it says there, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. I have seen... A version of this play out in my own home uh, in the few weeks since Dustin gave that invitation. Um, <clears throat> this is what I'm. This is what I'm getting at. Uh, back at Christmas time, uh, one of my sisters gave our kids a Nintendo Switch. It's a video game system, um, and this included Mario Kart, which is a racing game. In December and early January, Julius wanted to play. He was a little too young for it, though, so we would do the thing that a lot of families do with the youngest kid, right, which is that we give him an inactive controller, and he, you know, quote-unquote, picks one of the people on the screen, and <clears throat> he's watching, and he's cheering, and he'll claim that he's winning, but he wasn't really in control, right? He wasn't really running his own race. He was claiming a screen that was being controlled by one of the other kids, by someone else. Fast forward to today. It's, the, it's now the middle of February. He has learned enough to know how to actually participate. He gets a controller that is actually connected. He gets to actually pick his own character. He is now running his own race. He can read the screen well enough to know how he's doing, right? Is he in first place? Is he in second? Is he in third? Is he in last place? Julius is three years old. It's a challenging game. He's usually losing. Back in December, he didn't know enough to know how he was doing. Today, he is informed enough to recognize his own condition. And again, that condition, usually losing. He doesn't like that. In the spirit of 1 Corinthians 9.24, Julius isn't going to quit, though. He's going to keep running his own race, and he, can't, and he recognizes that he can't do it on his own. He can't run it in a way that is going to win if he's left to his own devices. So he asks for help. And I think the symbolism here is pretty neat. Now, Caleb, in his sermon on Sunday morning, um, brought up uh, Matthew 18.4, whoever will humble himself like this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. When Julius didn't know his condition, he didn't know that he was losing. As soon as he knew enough to understand his own condition that he was losing these races, he was humble enough to ask for help. 
in neither of these scenarios, right, when he was ignorant and when he had learned something, in neither of these scenarios is he capable of winning on his own. The only difference is that when he recognized it, he almost immediately and automatically starts seeking help so he can reach that goal of winning the race. It's kind of a silly example, right? But I think that you know there's a valid point that underpins it. Um, Julius is asking for help because he's humble. He's humble because he is a young child. For the rest of us, though, asking for help is harder. Right, uh, there are you know we. This is the place where we could like launch off into the entirety of a sermon, which we don't have time for tonight. Uh, but I think you know at a high level we could say there are a couple of reasons maybe that we don't ask for help. Right, number one, will others think less of me? Number two, how will my change reflect on my loved ones who don't change along with me? Um, <clears throat> now the reaction that you should get if you make a change is the one that is described in Galatians six two. Right. That if you reveal something about yourself that you need help with, and I am aware of that, then I should, as the verse says, uh, be willing to bear those burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. If you reveal that weakness uh, and ask for help, I, as your brother in Christ, should be willing and eager to help you in that. I think we would all agree with that and hope that's the place where we all stand on this. But I can't guarantee that, that, is, that you are going to get that response everywhere you go on the earth, right? Matthew 5 is full of warnings about being persecuted in spite of doing the right thing. Um, there has a reason for that. Verses 10 through 12 is just one of those examples. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you, and falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, I don't want to be glib, but if being persecuted in this way sounds stressful, then I have what you could take as some good news, right? That is just one more thing that you now need to ask for help about. Philippians 4, 6 through 7, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. To say this more plainly, right, we could look at 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast your anxieties on him because he cares about you. With those two verses in mind, do you have anything to be anxious about? The answer is yes. Yes, you do. We all do. If, right, if, you keep it to yourself. If you don't ask for help. If you don't make those prayer requests known to God. So with all that in mind then, what is troubling you? I don't know yet, right? This process of humbling ourselves, and asking for godly help is something that all of us need to do, right? Acts 2, 37 and 38 makes that very uh, clear. Uh, but if you have an opportunity to do that, asking of help, uh, not just of God. We also have that opportunity to ask of help uh, of the congregation yet this evening, right? And what we can say with confidence is that if you make those requests known you know, here and now, then we will take that spirit that's described there in Galatians 6.2 uh, in helping you to bear those burdens, whatever they may be, uh, if it's something that you make known. Uh, please do consider these things uh, of humbling ourselves and asking for help when we recognize the need um, please uh, consider all that as we stand and as we sing. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus.
and of course all our teachers that taught um, as mentioned of course let's keep our prayers uh, for Jim uh, through his surgery and uh, recovery and of course all those that are sick um, anybody that's on the road of travels let's be thinking about them as well um, is there any other announcements that need to be made tonight no takers if not we'll have Carrie Sarah closing prayer Pray with me. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this day. Thank you for all your blessings you've bestowed upon each and every one of us and our families. Father, we especially thank you so very much of that blessing of your Son so that we might have the opportunity to be with you when this life on earth is over. Father, at this time we ask you to be with those that have been mentioned sick, so many that we ask that you would heal them and comfort them and all would be well. We always ask you to be with Hannah and the baby. We all would go well with her and the baby. Father, we also ask that you would guide our footsteps as we go through life. We ask for forgiveness of those things we have done wrong. And we always want to look for you and your son. And we thank you so very much for him again. We also thank you for this time to come out together and to assemble and to open up your word and to study from it. We ask that we gain much knowledge and wisdom, and we use it to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. I 